Satnam. So, as before, let's start with going through the word, the spelling of the word, the background, the origin of the word itself. In Sanskrit, there are two very similar sounding words. One is Sat, and the other one is Satya. The first word, Sat, means existence. Satya means truth. Sat being that which exists, that which is here and now, that which is beyond past, the present, the future, it's all encompassing. It just exists. Satya is truth, and that means anything that is permanent or unchanging. To understand the difference, science is the pursuit of facts and truth, and art is the pursuit of existence. Art aims to personify that which exists. Science aims to look at facts, that which is always true and is always permanently true. In Satnam, it means both. It means truth and it means existence. The word Sat in Satnam means both. The spelling includes the first Sat, but it also includes a Sihari in there. That's to include Satya. So, sometimes in Barney, a Sihari has been added to indicate that the word comes from somewhere else. Or to shorten the full word being Satya, to shorten it, Barney has just put a Sihari to indicate that it comes from Satya, a longer word. Because of this spelling, all the translations only refer to this, that Satnam, his name is true, or his name is truth. But they miss out this interpretation of Sat from Sanskrit. And this is the one that is very interesting. His name is existence. And we'll go into both of those as well. The other thing to look at is Nam has an Ankur underneath it. Any word in Gurmukhi that has an Ankur underneath it has a few grammatical rules that are being applied to that word. Any word that has an onkar underneath it at the end represents a singular word and a masculine word. So, how do we know that that's correct? Even today in Punjabi, the word naam is a masculine word. Whether you're male or female, I would ask tera naam. You would say mera naam. You would never say meri naam, say mera naam, whether you're male or female. And that's because the word naam is masculine. So that's what this is indicating. This is a masculine word. In Gurbani, you can also have same spelt word without an onkar, and it makes it a plural word. So if naam didn't have an onkar underneath it, it would be plural. Like, he has many names, Nam would be spelt without the Ankar underneath. But wherever you see the word Nam with an Ankar underneath, it's a singular word, so it's a single thing. So here it's saying, Sat is the Nam of Ikonkar. Bear in mind, the word Sat Nam, even though it's masculine, 
does not indicate that God is masculine. God is gender neutral. So this is not saying God is masculine. It's saying Nam is masculine. The word Nam is a masculine word. So what does Nam mean? In its most basic sense, in Punjabi even today, Nam means the name. And how do we use Nam? The way we use Nam is the first way that we get to know someone or something. We apply a name to it. In order for our brains to comprehend something, it's easier if we give it a name. If you go to a friend's house and they've just bought a dog, what's the first thing you're going to ask? What's his name? So that if I'm going to refer to this dog from now on in our conversations, I'd rather, rather than call it dog, how's your dog? I'd say, how's Lucky or whatever. Right? So you're going to have to give a name to it. So our brains function in this way. The first thing that we want to do is we need to get a name. If you meet someone, the first thing you greet yourself, you say, hi, my name is. And you ask, what's your name? So we can break down that barrier first. So as soon as I get your name, I feel like I know something about you. I feel like I know you a little bit. And the same is applied for if we want to remember someone. So as soon as I give you a name, you're going to say, oh, I know who that is. Or say, oh, no, I've never met that guy. I don't know who that is. So this is how our brains use a name. It's the most important thing that we do to someone, is the first thing we do is we apply a name to someone so that we can say, okay, right now I know you a little bit. So it's the first thing that we use to get to know something or someone. We apply a name to it. Another meaning of Nam is awareness, consciousness. That's another translation of Nam. To merge with Nam doesn't mean to merge with a word. You can't merge with a, with a word, but you can merge with its beingness, its aliveness, its awareness. You can merge your consciousness with someone. You don't have to say the name of your beloved to have an image of them in your mind. And you can have an image of them in your mind the whole day. And the way that that's been translated is like you're reciting his name. You're reciting her name. So you're not necessarily saying their name. But you're aware of them. Your awareness of them is like you calling them. Is like you trying to pull them towards you. So that's the other meaning of Nam, your awareness, consciousness. See, if you don't see someone, a friend, for a long time, as soon as you say the word, as soon as I say their name to you, it'll bring an image of that person into your mind. And as soon as I say their name to you, all your emotions associated with that person are also brought to life. So Nam is very powerful. I just have to say the name of someone and everything that you know about that person, everything you like about that person, everything you dislike about that person will immediately come up. The same applies for someone that you don't like. I just have to say their name and if I say the name of someone that you really don't like, it changes the chemistry within your body. And all the, the wrong chemicals start getting released and you're like, oh, I don't like that person and you get angry and you get tense. And all I've done is just said their name. I've just literally said their name and all of a sudden you have this huge reaction within you because all of your associations are pinned on their name. So name is a very powerful thing. So what is Barney trying to say with Satanam? Why is this the next word? We covered what ik is, it's all oneness, it's all together. There is no you and me, there's no duality. It comes in the very primal form of Onkar, the very root of all creation, even though everything might look different, at the root of everything they're all the same vibration, Onkar. Why is Satanam next? What does Satanam mean? What Guru Nanak Dev Ji is trying to do here is say, this oneness, if you're going to give it a name, Sat is its name. 
There's no other real name that I can give you. Because if you say, okay, you've told me about this oneness, you've told me that it's in the form of vibration, what should I call it? What name should I give it? And Guruji is saying that Sat is its name. Existence is its name. All that exists is its name. If you want to call it something, call anything and you'll be calling the oneness. Say any word and it becomes alive. Say anything and it's there. That oneness is a part of everything. That truth that will never change is its name. And what it's saying is there's no other word that you can apply that will accurately give it a name. What name do you give the oneness? What name do you give everything and anything? Everything that has ever existed and ever, ever will exist. What name can you apply to that? That's all-encompassing. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is saying, there's no name I can give you. Everything that is, is its name. Its permanent nature is its name. It just is. The story of Moses when he is in the presence of God, the story goes that he climbed up a mountain, Mount Sinai, and he had a vision of God, and the vision of God came to him in, in the burning bush, and he was given an instruction to go free his people from bondage. And he said, people won't believe me if I say that I'm here to save everyone. Who shall I say has sent me? Who shall I say is my savior? Who's the one who's instructed me to do this? And the response that God gives is say, I am. I am has sent you. I am what I am. And that's the only name that God can say, I don't know what name you want me to give you, because I am what I am. This is what it is. Sat Nam. I am what I am. Guru Nanak is saying that all that exists is its name. There's no him, there's no her. Everything that does exist, everything that doesn't exist is his name. It is Sargun and Nirgun, formless and form. And if you want to know this God, you can know it just by looking at all of its creation. You can know by looking at any of its creation. Look at anyone and you will be looking at God. Oneness has no name. And yet everything is its name. You are its name. You are God's name. Your very life is God's name, God's work. This is why Gurbani has many names for God. There are so many, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to count the number of names, the different names that Gurbani uses. Because Gurbani isn't interested in limiting you to anything. It says pick any name, it doesn't matter. Some call it Ram, some call it Allah, some call it this, some call it that. Today we call God. It's irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant because no name is complete. No name tells you everything you need to know. No name is the all-encompassing name, the true name. So truth can be its only name. Existence can be its only name. All other names for God are just pointers, you are Paramatma, you are Rakhanhar, Rakhwala, you are like a father, you are like a mother. These aren't really names for God. These are just indicators of its character. They're just pointers, but they're incomplete. See, when you love someone, if you think about a child, there's so many different names that you can call it. You can call a child, oh my beautiful, oh my pumpkin, you know, whatever name you want, it, my honey, sweetheart. You mean the same thing. It doesn't change the characteristic of the being that you're calling. You can call it lots of different names, and yet none of them fully encapsulate what that means to you. Even if you call your son or your daughter or your you're beloved by their name, the name in itself doesn't even begin to describe what that person is to you. There's just a couple of letters on a page. 
So the word itself doesn't completely describe. So this is why names are limited. And Guru Nanak Dev Ji is acknowledging this by saying Sat is its Naam. But even though names are so limited, just remembering their name will bring up all the emotions that you have for that person. If I say to you the name of your child or your beloved or your best friend, it will bring up all of those emotions. So names are very limited, but yet they're so powerful at the same time. And even though it brings the emotions of what you associate with that person, it doesn't represent that person or that being in its entirety. And if you take the word love, for example, the word love doesn't even begin to describe the experience of love. It doesn't even begin to describe what the emotion of love is. So words can be very limited, but then as soon as you say love, only somebody who's experienced it will know what you mean. And in the same way, whatever word for God somebody uses doesn't mean anything. But as soon as you've known God, every name for God becomes beautiful. And this is why Gurbani can use so many names for God. Because in any language, any name for God brings the Bhagat into must. The saint will go into a, a tranquility, a trance, just by hearing any name for God. Why? Because names are so powerful. You say the word of God, you say the name of God, and it brings up all of my experience of it, and then the saint goes into a trance. So this is why, the, this is the, the sort of the, the dichotomy of name. It's useless and completely meaningless on one hand, and on the other side, it's the most powerful thing as well. So Gurbani is saying that if you want to know God, I can't really give you a real name. So I can tell you that everything is its name. In Jab Sahib, in the first verse, it says, Tav Sarab Naam Kathay Kavan. All of your names, Tav Sarab Naam Kathay Kavan. Who can describe all of your names? Karam naam barnat samat. I can only name your deeds. Karam naam. If you give me the understanding. Barnat samat. So I can name, so Jaap Sahib isn't naming God. Because Guruji says it isn't the name of God. There are too many names for God. Tav sarb naam kavan. How can one write down all of your names? It's not possible. And interestingly, Jaap Sahib ends at 199 verses. And in Islam, there are 99 names for God. And there's a reason. Why does Jaap Sahib end at 199? Why does Islam stop at 99? Guru Gobind Singh Ji could easily have rounded it up to 200 verses. But in the one missing verse, he gives you a clue. That in that one missing verse, that's his real name. No matter how many words I try to say, there's always one word that cannot be said. There's always his real name that cannot be spoken. And in Islam it says the same thing. There are 99 names for God, but in reality there's one name which is unspeakable, which is your very nature. Your very nature can't be spoken of. So there's a clue, it's a very beautiful clue in why these things don't quite complete. What name can you really give all of infinity? If you just for a moment think about the expanse of the universe and that in every direction it goes on infinitely, forever. In every direction it just doesn't stop. What name are you going to give something that includes all of that? How can a single drop of water describe the entire ocean in one word? Can't be done. So all names are temporary, but only one name is permanent, and that is Sat. The Sat, the truth, the unchanging permanent nature of God is its only true name. That's its only true nature. 
So Guru Nanak Dev Ji is saying, if you want to know oneness, look around you. This is God. Right here, right now, it's here. The oneness exists in all of existence, Sat. So the interesting question is, what part of creation can you use to find God? What part of existence do you have direct access to? If God exists in all of creation, then which part of creation do you have access to? You. If God is in all of creation, then the only bit of creation that you have access to is you. You can't experience what it's like to be a tree or a bird or a fish. But you can experience God through your own creation. If God has created everything and it is in everything, then it's also in you. And it's equally in you. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji is giving a clue here. If you want to find it, find it within your own creation. Find it within yourself. And if creation and existence is its name, then its name is within you as well. You are its name. You are God's name. Your very being here, being alive, being a part of creation, is part of Him. You are God. This is where you've got to go back to this, I am looking for God stuff. Because Guru Nanak Dev Ji is saying, it's already here and it's in you. And if creation is its name, then its name is not separate from you. Its name is you. You are God's name. Your very life is its Naam. You living is its Naam Simran takes on a whole new meaning to what Nam Simran is. Your very existence and everybody else's existence is its mantra. However you live. So the way of However you live. Irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It has created you in its, in its own perfection. It's created you in, it, in the way it feels that you need to live. It created a part of itself and that's what it wants to do with you. Good and bad. Yes? There are things that people do consciously, that's Gurmat. When you are conscious of your being, your connectedness with the One, that is Gurmat. When you live in ignorance and you forget your connection with the Oneness, then you're living according to your own mind. And your mind, you think, is the King, and you will follow whatever your mind says, that is Manmat. You Living as Gurmat or Manmat is his hukam. Barney says time and time again, You yourself created my ego, you yourself led me astray, and you yourself brought me back to you. Remember in that statement, there's no my, I, I. It's just you did this and you did this and you did everything. It's all you. Are you willing to let all of your pap and let it to him and say, it's yours. It's your sin. We're so scared of using terminology like this. It's yours. It's your problem. It's not mine. It's yours. I don't exist. All that exists is you. You are the sinner and you are the saint. Why should I bring myself into the equation? If you saw Guru Nanak Dev Ji's mathematical formula, where's the I in there? There's no... Don't bring yourself into the equation. When you bring the mayor into the equation, that's when all of it falls apart. When all of it is you and Tuhi, nothing to do with me, this is all you, then you realize that I don't need to, bring my, I don't need to worry myself with anything. And even if it was you, what can you do about it now? It's gone. Either you hold on to it and let it eat away at you, or you denounce it and say, it happened. It wasn't me. We cannot decide who lives 
consciously and who doesn't live consciously. A lot of things are happening in the world right now and there are people doing things unconsciously. And even though you might be an absolute saint and you don't do anything and you don't harm anyone, you could still be living just as bad as they are because you're unconscious. Just because you're not hurting anyone doesn't make you any better than anyone else. Because you're still just sitting in your own ego. I am. And that I am eventually turns into wars and rapes and murders. That is the furthest extent that I am can take you. That's all it is. So either you're part of this I am, this ego, this self-referencing I exist, or you're not a part of it. If you're a part of it, you're just as much to blame as the actual person who does it. Because you're both doing the same thing. One person thinks it, the other person does it. What's the difference? How many times have you killed someone in your mind? How many times have you wished someone to die? What's the difference between you thinking it and somebody else taking your thought and actually doing it? What's the difference? The only difference is the other person is affected. It's not preordained in the sense that everything is rewritten, but everything belongs to the one, so it's doing it to itself. The oneness is doing it to itself. God is feeding God and God is laughing at God. God is celebrating with God and God is destroying with God. There's a beautiful sh Shabbat basically says that there is one actor playing all the characters on a stage. When he goes backstage, he takes off all of his costumes and you realize that all the characters were the same actor. That's what you are. You're a character, be you're all characters being played by the same actor. And yet on stage, you're all on this stage right now, and you're fighting each other because like, well, I'm not you and I'm not you. But you're the same actor playing different roles. At the moment, we can only see the characters. We can't see the actor. The same actor is playing all the roles right now. God is talking to God and God is listening to God. And it's that mentality that avoids wars. But as long as there's a me and a you, then I'll fight you. As long as there's a, I like this guy and I don't like that guy, then it's going to lead to wars. And murder and all the horrible things that you see. They say that only the enlightened Buddha, only the, the Christ, the Mahapurk, is the only one that actually carries no karma. There's no consequences to his actions. That even they can kill someone, but there's absolutely no consequences because they're doing it in absolute awareness. Let's think about it. In reality, Guru Gobind Singh Ji killed quite a few people. Right? Do we think he's going to pay for some sort of sin? Why? Why is that different to you killing people? Because you and me will do it in our ego. Guru Gobind Singh Ji does it in absolute non-existential. So he already says, your karam has been written and it is not even my doing that my sword will chop your head off. It's nothing to do with me or you, it's just the play of the universe. So even a Buddha can kill and attain, amass no karam. Because they're doing it not out of their own selfish desire, of, there's no self involved. Who is there to even attain the karam? They don't exist to attain the karam in the first place. And that is seeing everything, all of creation, as the one, including yourself. You know, one thing that's an easy trap to do is to see God in everyone, but you don't see God in yourself. You can see God and you can say, oh, this is God, this is God, this is God, why grew, why grew, why grew, and you can get to, you know, a pretty good state of mind, yeah, I'm very good, but you never look within yourself. What's the point? You've missed it. You've completely missed the trick. Human beings are extremely tribal in our nature. And this is what we do. We aim to mold ourselves into any tribe that we, that we belong to or any tribe that we surround ourselves with. So if 10 people are doing something, eventually you're going to do it because you're just with them all day, every day. So when Barney recognizes that this is the human nature, Barney's saying, well, why don't you choose who the right people are that you're going to hang around with? If you're going to hang around with murderers, nine times out of ten, you're going to turn out into one of them. 
if you're going to hang around with people who are doing vichar, who are doing bani, who are meditating, then nine times out of ten, you're going to turn into one of those as well. Bani says, Murak nalna lujiya, do not associate with the fools. Do not associate with the ones who are going to take you down their path. If their path is one of ego, if their path is one of nindya chugli, of slandering, of beating people up, of, of bad things, call it whatever you want. If that's the nature, then you're, gonna, you're naturally going to take that on. And Barney uses lots of references, which is like the sandalwood tree has a fragrance and all the other trees begin to take that fragrance. It's saying the same thing. Basically saying, whatever it is that people do, you will absorb some of that if you spend your time with them. So if we're going to hang around with people who are all in their egos, which is what we've all done, and this is how we've all been brought up, then it's not surprising that we've also been brought up with egos. So, Nam, Nam is very powerful. Nam is extremely powerful. We've talked a lot about Sat being the Nam, but what about Nam Simran and using a particular mantra? When we talk about Nam Simran, let's first distinguish between the two. Nam Simran is the awareness of its presence in yourself and everything else all the time. That's Nam Simran. What we use interchangeably with Nam Simran, what we really mean is Mantar Jap, the recitation of a mantar, of a word. So when we say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm doing Nam Simran, in reality, what we're saying is we're doing mantar jap. And they are two different things. Neither one is good or bad, but they are actually two separate things. Nam Simran is just being aware all the time. And I don't have to be saying a word to look at you and see that there's God in you and there's God in me. I don't have to be saying a word to do that. So that isn't, that's Nam Simran is just knowing that everything is God. This is you, this is God, this is God, this is God. You're just knowing that all the time. Mantar Jab is still very important, and that's why it's so synonymous with Nam Simran. Saying certain words in most of our daily conversations, we find that words are quite futile. So if you look at the example, if you're very thirsty, and I say the word water to you, is that going to quench your thirst? If I say the word water to you a thousand times, in every different language, is that going to quench your thirst? So, saying a word, in our experience, saying a word is not the same as, as drinking, as having the experience of what that word is talking about. So that's why we don't actually have any faith in Nam Simran, in Mantar Jap. Because we're like, well, can it really work? If I just say the word Why Guru a thousand times, is it actually going to do anything? But Nam is not like any other word. Nam, and when Barney talks about Nam and Mantar, is not like just saying the word water a thousand times and hoping that it's going to quench your thirst. Nam is part and parcel of the thing that it's talking about. Nam works more like heat from fire than it does the word water. You can't separate heat from fire. Fire is hot. You can't separate the two. And that's like Nam. Nam is ingrained with what it's talking about. And that's why you can use any word. The word that you use is less important. It's the mindset that you have, which is I can see God in you, in you, God in you, God in me, God in you. I can see it as I'm talking. That's the mindset that you have to get into. I can see you. I can see you right now. I'm looking at you, and I can see that it's the bigger you. It's not the individual I'm looking at. It's the bigger you that I'm looking at. And it's not me seeing you. It's you seeing you. Even to say, I can see you, is to say, I and you. But it's saying you, 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 you are talking to you. God is feeding God. God is laughing at God. God, God, God. So Nam Simran works like this. Mantra Jap works like this. It's about having an awareness with it. If you're just watching telly and just leaning back and you've got your mala, why grew, why grew, why grew, but you're really, your tian is on telly or anywhere else, 
or you're sitting in Kirtan, but you're really looking at all the people who are coming to Mathatik and say, oh, what are they wearing and what, how much money are they putting down? Your Naam Simran is disassociated from your awareness. So Naam Simran has to be completely part of your awareness. It's about being present. It's about breaking the duality of I exist and you exist. And it's about recognizing that God is reciting God's name. Barney says, You allow me to recite and then the recitation happens. You allow me to sing. And actually the word me isn't even in that line. You allow the singing and the singing happens. You allow the Naam Simran and the Naam Simran happens. You are reciting your own name. Let's, let's give you an example of, of name. Everybody, just close your eyes. And what I want is I want all of you not to think of a black cat. Open your eyes. Anybody manage it? Did you think? When I say the words, don't think about a black cat, most of you think of a black cat, because that's the first thing that pops into your head. This is how a name works, how powerful a name is. So Naam, Simran, Mantra, Jap is very powerful. Anything you say, it carries weight with it. If I say the name of your beloved, it's going to carry those connotations with it. If I say the name of someone you don't like, it's going to carry those connotations with it. If I say the word snake, some of you will say, oh, I really like snakes. And some of you will say, oh, I'm never going to touch a snake in my life. Don't even say the word snake. Right? But I've not actually brought a snake into the room. I've just said the word snake. But every single one of you will have a different reaction based on your own experiences, your life experiences. So a word itself carries a lot of weight. This is why mantra, jap, nam, simran is so important. Because words carry so much weight. And this isn't like just saying, water, 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 come and quench my thirst. Just by saying the name of God in any way, in any language, with the right mentality, God becomes pargat, becomes manifest. Because you're not calling Mr. God from far away. You're saying, I see you. You are seeing you. You are reciting your name. You are here. You're already here. This is you. This is you. And that's a very important mantra that me personally that I use. Rather than actually using a word, the mantra that I use is this is you. When I open my eyes, everything I see is you. When I close my eyes, the one doing it is you. All that there is is you. The one saying it is you. So to me personally, I use this is you. Not that I am you, or you are here, or you are me, or you are mine. Because I don't want to bring in me. This is you, right now, right here, right now, this is you doing it. And I take no credit for it. I don't exist. So mantar is the manifestation. By using the word, you manifest that which has no word. Ikonkar has no word. You bring it alive. It brings it to your awareness. It brings it to your consciousness. If you kept saying the, the name of your beloved you would feel all those things that you feel for them. So imagine you say a name for God. Eventually, it starts becoming that. We were just talking about Kabir Ji has a Shabad. Tu tu karta tu hua mujh mein raha na hu. Tu tu, by saying tu tu, you, 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 all the time, I became you. You became me. Mujh me raha nahu, nothing was left of me. Tu tu, by saying tu hi, tu hi, tu hi, tu hi, you, 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 you became present. And everything that was in me disappeared. Jab apa parka mit gaya, jat te khanta tu When the veil of separation between me and everybody else was dropped, then everything I saw is you. Everything I see is you. So this is the power of saying Naam, of saying a mantra, of reciting it again and again. Does anyone do Kundalini Yoga? Have you ever done the Kirtan Kriya? What do you use, what mantra do you use for that? 
Satanama, Satanama. So there's a Kundalini Kriya called Kirtan Kriya, where you're sitting and you're reciting Satanama. First you do it with your, with your tongue, you say it out loud. The second one you whisper, Satanama, Satanama. The third one, you just recite it in your head. And then you go back to, to saying it out loud. You know, it only gives you the first three stages. Out loud, it gives you whispering, it gives you the silent remembering, but there's a fourth stage that Harpajan Singh Yogi couldn't give you. Sata Nama, out loud, whisper, and the silent within your mind. But there's a fourth stage which is beyond Nam. And that's the one that can't be given to you, that's the one that has to come out from you itself. So it's a very beautiful Kriya, if you ever get a chance to do it, Kirtan Kriya. There are three stages to it, but there's actually a fourth stage. But that one, even Yogiji can't give that to you. Nobody can give you that last final name. And the same applies to Nam Simran. Some people say you do Nam Simran from your word. Some people say it comes from your, from your Nabi, from your um, belly button on, upwards. And you've got to recite it with each breath. Some people say Sata as you're going out or Wahe as you're going out, and Guru as you're breathing in, or the other way around. And all of these are fantastic techniques, but know that these are more sort of superficial techniques. The whole point ultimately, however you do it, the whole point ultimately is the awareness is awoken. And when you open your eyes, that Nam Simran is going on. Again, with, with different yoga, Kundalini yoga and others, uh, have you ever tried to do a, a mantra har? You're just doing har, har, har. Have you ever tried doing that? What happens when you stop doing it? It carries on, right? You're doing it, and if you do a har mantra, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, and after that, you, you open your eyes, you stop, but it can't stop. It just keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. So that's the point of Nam Simran, is even when you open your eyes, even when you finish listening to the Kirtan, the Katha, Hukam Nama, anything, when you walk out of the Darbar, the Darbar hasn't left you. It's still there. The awareness is still there as you're looking at everybody. This is you, this is you, within you, this is you. As you're eating, this is you. Food, you are eating you, you are you. You are drinking, you. This is you, this is you, this is you. So Nam Simran is not just words. It's a complete awakening of your consciousness. Nam Simran has to be done with word and awakening, awareness. You can't just do Nam Simran and just be like, you know, you're doing something else. Your mind is on something else. Because then you're just saying it with your tongue. There's no awareness with it. Nam Simran has to be the combination of the word, whether it's spoken out loud or not, or the awareness. It has to be both of those things mer merged together. And the point of the Nam Simran is that you lose the duality of you trying to find God. You trying to merge with God. It becomes God is doing God's Nam Simran. That's the point of it. That you are, are lost in it. Tu tu karta tu hua, mujme raha nahu. Nothing is left of me. All that became manifest was you. That's Kabirji. You ultimately get to the stage where the whole universe is singing its own praises. God is singing God's praises. Your very existence is God's praises.